think a lot of what you're seeing with machine learning and AI today is just a set of steps and, and processes that analysts would typically perform by hand. It's mm -hmm. just done automatically. And so an analyst back then would say, look at revenue. What are things that would lead to revenue or be predictive of revenue? And then how can we optimize whatever systems are in place? And in that case, it was people systems in workflows and patient care flow. And I think that's exactly what a lot of people are trying to do today. Look for, well, what is the better outcome? Trying to find those features that are predictive of those outcomes and then train some sort of a model that will help them understand the path to get there. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy! Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today, we're talking with Josh Broughton. Josh is the CEO of Brand Data, where him and his team use brand measurement, consumer insights, and growth solutions to turn fast-moving companies into market leaders. Prior to Brand Data, Josh was a senior director of marketing at Lead Pages. From venture-backed startups to Fortune 500 companies, Josh has developed his skills in high-growth digital marketing environments by working with brands who want to grow fast. As a business consultant, turned technologist, turned marketer, turned entrepreneur, I can't wait to talk with Josh about his career path and where he sees the future of artificial intelligence going in a variety of industries. When Josh is not growing brands, he's volunteering for the Minnesota Search Engine Marketing Association and exploring futuristic technologies like virtual reality or spending time with family, most likely cooking. Thanks, Josh, for being on the program today. Thanks for having me, Justin. Awesome. Well, great. Well, I gave a, a maybe a brief description of where you're at today, but maybe you can give a maybe a little bit more detail with the background about you know who you are and and sort of what the trajectory of your career has been. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of had a, a, a varied career, but I think everything that I've done is kind of added up to who I am today. So started off working in hospitals as a revenue cycle consultant, working on, you know, numbers based mm -hmm. projects to try and figure out how hospitals could get paid by insurance companies more so that they keep their doors open, provide services. From there, kind of transitioned to the IT side of healthcare, just because I liked, you know, the, the data side of things. Ended up working on a lot of web projects in that capacity and ended up getting sucked into marketing because at that time, SEO and analytics and some of these new advertising tactics were just emerging and found those to be really interesting as well. Got into those and spent more than a dozen or so years working on digital marketing in all sorts of different settings. And then for the last about five years, we've been running brand data. It's our brand measurement and growth agency. We've been helping clients big and small, basically any brand that wants to be the, the, the leader in its category, we can help them develop metrics and measurement plans around their brands. And finally, just in the last year or so, we've been self-funding our own project, Snapoo, which is an AI-powered dog poop analyzer that helps dog owners raise healthier, happier, longer living dogs. So that's kind of a long road, but uh, I swear it's all related. It's been a fun one. I love it. I love it. And I know we'll, we'll dig a little bit more into Snapoo here further on in the conversation. But, you know, I was wondering as you were sort of working through your, your career, it sounds like there's a lot of data. You know, you mentioned revenue cycle consultant. I, that sounds very dry, <laughs> I guess. But, you know, you, so you have a background in, in, in math, I guess, you know, or, or, or something with regards to numbers. I was an econ major in okay. college and from there, consulting was really appealing to me because I got to go and travel a lot, got to mm -hmm. impact companies at a, at a higher level and really receive a lot of, I guess, training that, that I felt was a little bit more beyond just a, an entry level college graduate. So really enjoyed that first role or that first job as a revenue cycle consultant. And it set me on a course of always looking at like, well, what, what are we trying to accomplish? So the idea of what's what's the end goal or or trying to keep that end in mind in the in the for hospitals, it was trying to make sure that they weren't getting their claims denied by insurance companies because for some reason or other, the hospital didn't follow their procedures correctly that are in their contract. So either the patient didn't have the right type of insurance or they presented without their card or they didn't get the right authorization, all these different things in network, out network are reasons why 
companies or insurance companies don't have to pay hospitals. And so we would help them set up different policies and practices and teams and workflows to streamline those processes to make sure that they just ask that patient for that insurance card. A lot of things that are very routine now were not that that way in the you know early 2000s and so these best practices were were set because they led to better outcomes on the back end yeah for sure i mean are there some things i'm just sort of like spitballing here but are there some things that now it's whatever it be 15 years in the future or whatever it is now bringing it back to artificial intelligence sort of machine learning is are there data practices that you've learned over your career maybe uh even through the marketing all the work you're doing with Snapu, stuff like that, that you could maybe see being applied back then, but it was obviously way too early. Absolutely. I think a lot of what you're seeing with machine learning and AI today uh, is just a set of steps and, and processes that analysts would typically perform by hand. It's mm -hmm. just done automatically. And so an analyst back then would say, look at revenue. What are things that would lead to revenue or be predictive of revenue? And then how can we optimized whatever systems are in place. And in that case, it was people systems and in, in workflows. And, you know, what are the things that would predict those higher revenue outcomes? And, and I think that's exactly what a lot of people are trying to do today. Look for, well, what is the better outcome? Um, trying to find those features that are predictive of those outcomes and then train some sort of a model that will help them understand, you know, the path to get there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's kind of dovetails into my typical question that I ask people is, how would you in generally define AI? I know you're using it in some contexts, very much in your startup, but probably also in, in some of your day-to-day -day stuff that you're doing with brand data. You know, if, if somebody were to ask you on the street, how do you define it? Yeah, I think it's, it's very interesting because it sounds futuristic, but I think it's really just more about the ability to measure and respond to patterns that humans can't fully understand. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of data points. And I think we tend to fixate on certain ones because they end up being more often than not the best metrics to look at. Like revenue, it's pretty hard to say that revenue is not a good metric if you're trying to grow sales. But there are certain data signals that can predict whether or not that revenue is going to happen or even lead to more revenue if you know what to look for. And, and so that's where AI has really helped uncover a lot of value in all sorts of different sectors that, that humans didn't, didn't see before, you know? There's the classic story, I think it's like over a decade now, where there was a, a man who received an email from Target that said, congratulations on your pregnancy. And it was, you know, towards his daughter and he was really offended that Target got it wrong. And turns out if you buy, what was it? Prenatal vitamins, cotton swabs, and one other thing, strong correlation with pregnancy. And it turns out that Target understood that that uh, his daughter was pregnant before he did and he ended up had, having to like apologize to her. So I, I love the idea that technology can do that for us and it's just a matter of getting the right signals uh, and being able to tie those to the, to the outcomes to create those patterns. It's like an ocean of data and how do you find sort of that, you know, that one cup that you're looking for sometimes. But once it does happen, it's uh, pretty amazing. You know, you can start spotting trends and stuff like that. And, you know, one of the other things that I like to ask people is, you know, what, what are some of your greatest strengths and weaknesses? It seems like you are a trend spotter, I guess, of, of sorts. But yeah, maybe, maybe as you take a look back in terms of you know, what you're doing today, but also in the past, you know, what, what are some things that you find that you're doing well or some other things maybe you could work on just in general? Boy, you know, I think, you know, strengths are definitely looking at being a trendsetter, entrepreneurial, tend to try to maximize whatever things that I'm, I'm working on to make them as good as they can possibly be. I think there, there are some, you know, downsides to getting attracted to new trends because oftentimes you can be early on things. For example, I walked around for a year with Google Glass on because I, I felt like very confident. I'm still very confident that we will live in a world with a heads up display, but I was completely off and I misinterpreted what the value of that of that experience was and also like what the negative kind of externalities of that technology were for for other people and how that friction might might not or might play against the adoption right so so I I don't know I think it's it's always interested to be interested in in the future and seeing where we're going to go but I think it's easy to get blindsided by kind of the the different forks in the road and what people end up finally doing sort of preaching to the choir here, I, I do find myself going off the deep end, especially with new technologies around internet of things and in some ways AI and ML for 
you know, you've been going on it for many years now. And sure, there definitely are some spikes, some certain areas that gain a lot of traction, but also a lot of areas where we think it could be used anywhere at any time, you know. And so you sort of run through into this Gartner hype cycle curve, if you've heard of that. I feel like I'm always five years early on things and tend to either get to things right before that trough of disillusionment (laughs) or stick with it long enough in certain cases to get to that productive plateau that folks are looking for as as new trends become mainstream. So I think for me, it's just as I get older, I try to temper that enthusiasm for a new technology with the pragmatism of, well, how long is this going to take? Do I have the time, capital or interest to to actually bring this trend to some place where I can call it a hobby or maybe even monetize it in some way? Yeah. So you've been very much into marketing, it sounds like, and and obviously new trends, Google Glass, is, that's, sort of, that's sort of out there for sure as well. I guess, talk me through how you've been looking to use AI and ML at Brand Data. Let's talk a little bit about your startup as well. Some of the ways in which you're sort of seeing artificial intelligence or machine learning being applied to businesses. Yeah, so on the Brand Data side with our clients, it's it's fascinating because advertising right now is is in complete upheaval. Mm-hmm. You have these competing dynamics where privacy is actually taking away a lot of data signals that people have been using to optimize their advertising efforts. So for example, today is January 19th. It's important because today is the first day where Facebook will no longer allow advertisers to use certain targeting characteristics like health interests, political interests, and other sensitive topics that could be deemed, you know, violations of privacy. Up until now, Advertisers were able to, if you wanted to find somebody who was interested in certain political beliefs, you just typed it in and said, I want to target people with these beliefs or people with a certain health condition. I want to, I want to advertise to these folks. It's very, very easy. And that's been driven by, you know, a decade and a half of performance marketing and, and everybody is seeing ROI on these types of ads. But now it's, you know, there's that backlash when it comes to privacy. And this is happening at the same time where the platforms are are getting so good at optimization that they might not even need some of the signals that we traditionally have had. So for example, I've talked to a lot of different brands, performance marketing teams, agencies that work for brands, been talking a lot about this. There are a lot of folks that are saying, you know, even the best first party data uh, systems where you have all of the downstream data on a customer, all their purchases, all of their channels, all their touch points, a lot of different demographic, psychographic, you know, behavioral data, all of those different things. Even if you have all of that and you feed that to the platforms, typically, or in a lot of cases now, the platforms themselves, they'll do better if they if you just give them a list of your customers. Mm. Because what they're hey. saying is that we have more signals on these folks than you could even dream of capturing so that just tell us who they are and we'll we'll find people just like them. And so it's interesting because it's, it, we're seeing this tidal riptide of data going out with all of this loss of privacy data. But the question is, will it matter? Will we see performance gains long term or will the platforms catch up and, and help us uh, advertisers continue to see the types of performance that we've seen for the last you know couple of years? Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, I haven't been tracking that in terms of like when that was going to happen. And so, so can I, I mean, if it comes down to like race and gender and age, can I not do that anymore? Like target a, a white person at age 32, you know, in Minnesota anymore? Or Those are just basic demographic characteristics that still are, are allowed to be targeted. Okay. Uh, we're talking about more granular political beliefs, health related <laughs> data, things that are considered a little bit more sensitive. And I think the idea there is is that they want to make it a little bit more safer experience for people to browse on the internet so that if you Google something that's very personal, that all of a sudden like you don't end up with 17 different Facebook ads that are talking about something that maybe you feel is, is private or a violation of, of that trust that, that you granted the advertisers that's a, you know, that are on the internet. I'm not sure if it's just, you know, like luck of the draw or what have you, but I have seen sometimes it feels like I've Googled something and then I've gotten an email related to something I just searched for, you know? So it's like, you just yeah. never know if it's if there's a lot of something going on behind the scenes, some sort of tie back to that. A lot of those things are not coincidence. There are, you know, explicit advertising checkboxes and, and tabs that you can optimize to make sure that people see things, you know, in those circumstances. Sure, sure. Well, they have a treasure trove of data. 
I don't know. I've always sort of thought as long as it's being used for good and consumers find value in it, it's it's no you know harm to me per se. But it certainly gets a little disconcerting at how granular that data gets and how much they know about you. And then obviously, once that data gets out, if it's leaked, it's probably more of the larger concern. I think everybody has their own personal philosophy about this. I f- I I personally understand how much data they actually have about you know us in, yeah. in all of these different things. So I opt into a, a lot of things because I want to use them. But then I turn all the features on because I know they have it on the back end. So why don't I see what they have on the front end? So for mm-hmm. example, location sharing on on Google Maps. It's a very easy way to tell you know friends and family that you know I'm out running errands or I'm safe when I'm on long road trips. That kind of stuff. Just turn on location sharing, invite a person for 12 hours or so while you're on your cross-country road trip and and you don't have to worry about the phone calls and text me when you get there, like all that kind of stuff. <laughs> sure. It's the new version of that, right? And and so that extra kind of transparency creates the extra utility if you know how to look for it. Yeah, yeah. so there's a use, right, for it. And in your mind, you don't care that Google knows where you're at because they're going to know where you're at anyways. Why, why not actually you know, derive a benefit out of it to share well, it? They're getting benefit out of it. Why can't I? Right. (laughs) That's true. It goes back to like, you are the product, right? In a lot of ways. Let's talk about poop tracking for a minute or so. What's going on with your startup? For the last year or so, we've been working on Snapu, which is the world's first AI-powered dot poop analyzer. It works because ultimately there's so many different things about your dog's health that can be determined through looking at a stool sample. If you think about it, the first time your dog's not feeling well, you call up your vet, you're saying, hey, what do I do with my dog? And they're saying, well, bring in a stool sample. Mm-hmm. They'll look at the consistency. They'll look at the color. They'll look at a lot of the different potential dangers that could be presented in a dog, like zoonotic parasites, uh, which are like worms, pyrovirus, dehydration, like all sorts of different things. Visually, they'll be able to take a look at it and say, yep, this is what's wrong with your dog. So we figured we could employ you know, image classification tactics and then have a level of, of synthesis where we could kind of figure out like what's happening there and then ultimately let people know what's going on with their dog's poop and over time coach them into raising a healthier dog through different suggestions and coaching and tips. So we got the idea when we were out walking our dog one day. We talk actually a lot about IBD on the human side. And so we're always talking about poop and and then we were walking our dog one day and it just kind of clicked. We we're like, we should totally do a, an ML dog or an ML slash AI app for dogs. That's great. And so you said you guys are in uh, sort of a private, private beta right now? Yeah, so we're finishing up our private beta. We launched that private beta last fall and we've got about 50 folks or so that uh, have been uh, invited to join and have been exploring the, the product and helping us calibrate the, the technology to make sure that we're kind of sorting out the, the right results. There's some sensitivity that we're training it to right now because certain things show up more frequently than they should. And so we're kind of fine tuning the sensitivity to our model right now. Interesting. Is this publicly available? I mean, is there, is there a website, stuff like that that people can go to? Oh yeah, being the uh, <laughs> marketer entrepreneur, we have a website, there's a, an email list, there's all sorts of different ways that you can engage with us. Snaphoo.com is where you can go to, to learn more about the product you can request to join the beta. And once you do, we'll be able to send you a link to be able to download the latest version. It's a, it's in an APK. It's not on the actual Google Play Store or the iTunes Store yet. It will be. We're shooting to try to get that out in the first quarter or second quarter, but we're building some new features based on feedback that uh, we want to introduce as part of launch. That's awesome. Very, very cool. I guess dogs could be one thing, but you know, could you do this with cats or hamsters or guinea pigs or other... Animals. You know, we thought about it. In theory, you can, right? Because with image classification, you just need a large enough data set. You need to have some features to train it on and then, you know, figure out a way to create some utility from it. But there are challenges for each type of, of poop. We actually had the idea for humans first because, you know, we're, we're a family that is uh, very, very close to a sort of colitis. And so we're, we're always talking about poop and we're thinking about doing it for humans. But there's all sorts of barriers to that. There's privacy barriers. There's kind of just inertia type habit type barriers. A lot of people do their business a very specific way and taking a picture afterwards might not might not work. And then lastly, there's all sorts of just sensibilities, you know, privacy concerns, like 
taking your camera in the bathroom with you is generally not something that people want to do. Yeah, sure, um, sure. So we ruled out humans. Cats was also another one that we initially thought of. But if you think about cats, they tend to cover their poop with cat litter. And so you end up, you know, obfuscating a lot of the different signals that you'd need to analyze. And so for dogs, it's perfect because you're outside with them in a lot of cases. You're taking them on walks. You know, a lot of times you have to pick it up anyway. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking. You're usually right there. We did a survey, you know, we, we asked a thousand plus people via Twitter all sorts of questions about their behaviors with dogs and taking care of their dogs and smartphones. And over 90% of dog owners have already taken at least one picture of dog poop in their life for some reason or another. And so this is not something that would come as a huge shock for people, I'm sure. And so we thought, uh, we thought for all those reasons, dogs was definitely the right market to start in. Yeah, that's great. Well, we have sort of liner notes for each one of the episodes. So I'll be sure to mention it and you know, put links to snapoo.com in those notes so people can check them out. Great. You mentioned about going out and walking dog. So, uh, you know, obviously you, you, you mentioned before, as you know, before we started recording, you're working from home. I mean, what's, what's a day in the life of a, a person in your role? Sure. Well, being an entrepreneur that runs an agency and has a lot of different clients, and then also trying to self fund, you know, an AI app, there's a lot of different hat switching. So we're, we're constantly working from different brand measurement projects, different brand growth projects, learning different things about the ad platforms, different survey platforms and uh, delivering results, all sorts of different things. And, and then what if, whatever time that we have left over, we are dedicating to getting Snapoo further along. And so we're getting feedback from customers, interpreting how we need to translate that into features, building those features, getting feedback. It's on the product side, on the tech side, we're learning so much about so many different parts of the actual tech stack of, of building an app. And then on the marketing side, it's just trying to get people to do stuff that they had didn't think that they need. So for new tech products, it's kind of hard to know when something's going to sell right away, like hotcakes, right? It's a term that I like to think about a lot. It's just, does this sell like the expression hotcakes? Right. Right? Originally, when the car came out, it sold right away because it was it was amazing. And people knew immediately that they wanted to, to have it. Production was very cheap and it sold like hotcakes, essentially, because it was a great, it had a great product market fit. And then some are hit like a dud, like Google Glass, right? Mm-hmm. And so trying to tell the story of this new technology and, and get peop- people to see what you see as a founder is kind of a huge challenge, but, but still it's, it's a lot of fun with whatever time that we have left over in a given day. Totally agree with you in my seat as with regards to multiple hats, right? I am the founder and CEO of a Flab 651, but also building technology and running a number of different startups, doing this podcast and having the Applied AI meetup and, and running a nonprofit. It's just a lot of different things. It's, it's an exciting time though, right? I think to be in technology. It, it but, really is. I think some people will say, oh, Justin, you should focus. You know, you should, and, and this is where you'll see a lot of, mm-hmm. especially VCs and advisors talking to startup founders, they'll say, you should really focus on this one thing that you're doing. And yet the prevailing wisdom for VCs is that you need to diversify as much as possible. And so I think as entrepreneurs, the idea of diversifying your professional interests and things that you focus your attention on is actually unconventional, but very positive path to, to go down because that's how you can become somewhat of a renaissance person in the sense that you're a painter, you might be an inventor, you might be a, a philosopher, that kind of thing. Only today, it's you might be an entrepreneur, you might be a startup founder, you might be a podcast host, and you're not having to be defined by one thing. And I don't know, I think it helps me end up having more energy throughout the day because I don't end up having to do things that I don't like to do so much, I can delegate or partner with people for those things and end up applying my efforts to the things that really appeal to me. Couldn't agree more. Well, as you've been working in, in you know, AI ML space, I like to ask people like, so what sort of projects have you seen? Were there some interesting things that, you know, and it doesn't even have to be things that you have personally done, but as you're like, kind of like looking through the news, things come across your desk. What, what are some cool things you're seeing going on out there? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's always interesting because when you see something, it's not always obvious that it is AI sometimes. Um, Sometimes it's very, very clearly like touted as AI. I think one of the things that I think was most profound 
to me recently was Google's AlphaFold technology that they've been working on for a, a number of years now. But just last, last year, they ended up making a huge breakthrough prior to Google AlphaFold, which is the protein folding uh, artificial intelligence that is supposed to predict on all these infinite, it's like 10 to the 30, 30th power uh, number of different ways that these proteins can unfold. And, wow. and knowing that is the key to understanding so much about you know ourselves and, and, and health in the future and that sort of thing. So prior to this, 17% of protein structures known to, to mankind or, or pure person kind were, were plotted out, all the, the different 3D structures of these proteins. And now we've got nearly 99% predicted with high degrees of accuracy. And this was just a, a giant orders of magnitude leap you know, on a problem that geneticists have been thinking about for decades. And this was just AI, right? This is, it represents kind of the extreme positive side of how the technology can help our, our species and, and just us as people, you know, benefit in, in the world. So I think that's always great. You always hear about the, the negative sides too, but this is one of the things I think shines through is like this, this might actually save us <laughs> versus turning into the Terminator type scenarios that you hear about too. Sure. Well, you mentioned the negative side. Well, I guess, what are some issues that you could see with artificial intelligence going into the future? I mean, there's all sorts of issues. I think some of them, and they range a lot too. Some of them are very practical, such as in business today, there are all sorts of biases that are introduced into AIs that prevent access to certain people. So for example, in recruiting softwares, certain populations are underrepresented in candidate pools because AIs are created by those who are enforcing current systems. And so right. it's difficult to to kind of use AI in that scenario without understanding how biases are are impacting, you know, things like candidate flow. So those are like current challenges. I think in the future, you have uh, a lot of today's more powerful figures who I'm imagining have a lot more time access and money invested into these areas and you hear them saying, well, we need to legislate around this immediately. We need to draw some guardrails on the world in terms of what we want to allow AI to do and what we want to have be off limits because obviously we could do a lot with this type of thing. And I think yeah. if you've seen shows like Black Mirror, it's uh, not unthinkable to think of, you know, swarms of micro drones that are programmed to look for people and and that sort of thing. So I think those are the really scary things that nobody really wants to think about. But yeah, so I try to think about the positive things like, you know, being able to map all the protein structures and use those in medical science. You know, it's funny. I was just, uh, you were talking about sort of people thinking it's AI, but it's not really AI. And there, there have been a lot of startups that I've known of that like, it's actually human behind the scenes, right? They use something like Mechanical Turk to actually do the work. And then I thought about bad things. And I don't know if you've been following sort of the Elizabeth Holmes and, and Theranos and all that type of stuff where, you yeah. know, as an entrepreneur, she promised all these things. And at the end of the day, well, A, it didn't work. But then B, if you read the book about it, they were actually just funneling the data off to these other much more expensive machines, laboratories where people were manually doing all the work and then sending the information back to the machine. So it was like, ta-da, look at this machine. It's doing all these things with a drop of blood. And it's like, no, there's actually a whole team of scientists behind, you know, the curtain <laughs> that you have no idea that actually, you know, so you're for sort of false promising a lot of these things. Is that so wrong? I mean, uh, from my standpoint, if I'm an end user and I, it gets the job done, whether it's, you know, using AI or ML or it doesn't, the technology in some ways doesn't matter, as long as it's providing a service in some way that you know you will eventually, you know, automate is that so bad? That's a great question. I think as marketers, we're faced with that question all the time. I think answering that question can happen in two ways or should anyway. Number one, is it technically correct or incorrect? And that's where is like, is the technology actually ML, AI? In that situation, probably not, you know? And then philosophically, is it AI? Hmm. Does it do the same sort of things that, that maybe the technology could accomplish? And I think that's really important to make a distinction too, because oftentimes there are a lot of different startups and a lot of different startup founders that, well, you'll have the startups that are trying to do something AI related and you'll have startup founders that are plagued with imposter syndrome. And they're like, well, mine doesn't, mine's not AI quite yet, but it's going to be, right? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important distinction because if it's on the path or on the product roadmap to actually make the machines do something, then 
then being able to market that vision ahead of time as, you know, it's going to be an AI technology, I think that's okay. Aspirational is different than being deceptive. If it's not AI and there's no intention of being AI and you know it's not AI and you're just using it to scam people, obviously right. that's not okay. Exactly. And, and, and I guess some of it is, is around efficiency. Some of the things that I like to think about is, is, you know, how does this impact the future work of humans? And, you know, some people think about, oh, look at all these jobs that are going to be gone. But, you know, if you've listened to me in prior podcasts, I, I'm usually more on the optimistic side where it's usually the jobs that people don't want to do that I, that I sort of see the greatest benefit coming uh, to us in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years with this new technology. Is that, does that resonate with you? Do you sort of agree with that or have a different view? You know, it's always so difficult to understand whether new technology is going to create more, more demand for new types of jobs or whether it's going to replace jobs in a way that's net negative. Some of the conversations that I've been hearing in business circles is suggesting there might be a short-term net negative workforce mm -hmm. reduction. So ultimately, maybe losing some jobs in the, in the near, near term. But it's hard to say if that's because they're going to need to retool at some point in the future for some of those newer jobs, or if they're just going to go to different parts of the economy or, or something else, right? Or if they're just going to be gone forever. So I think it's too early to tell. I do think we are in a sector or we're in an economy right now where large parts of our workforce are, are built upon sectors that are ripe for displacement and automation. So yeah. retail, service, serv the service sector, you know, there's a lot of those types of jobs that could be subject to automation. And anytime you have those large changes that can't be quickly offset by gains in innovation, that's where you might have, I don't know, some short-term or even medium or long-term, I guess, employment declines because of, of how automation has offset that, that demand for labor. Andrew Yang has a book out uh, called The War on Normal People. And his philosophy is, is that he thinks that this is actually a, a different type of uh, revolution. So the industrial revolution happened, right? But then people left the farm and they went to the factories to build these machines, right? And so there's always sort of been this next path where it's just like, you know, I, I, I can move into this next industry where I'm actually doing something. And, you know, he fundamentally thinks that now this intelligence and where's the humans that maybe don't have the intelligence, right? No one can become a software engineer. Like not everyone's going to become a software engineer, right? There's a maximum <laughs> with regards to what people need to do to build out there. And so it can be scary, but I, I, I don't know. I always believe that, you know, people got worried when all, when all sorts of things, you know, would, would change within the economy and new, you know, tools and advancements would happen. And people are like, looks like I'm out of a job, but... There's always something else. I feel like there's always something else around the corner. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think, you know, figures like Andrew Yang too, they're talking about, they're drawing parallels to different points in history that actually where there were giant shifts in different types of curves rather than just fluctuations. And so, for example, during the early 20th century, you had industrial revolution and you had that large kind of change in labor that Yang was talking about. And that led to a lot of social change too, because as you had people moving from the countryside into the cities, mm -hmm. they were so little regulated at the time that the industrial barons of the time could set the terms of, of how those people came into the cities, how they lived, what type of wages they were able to get, what type of protections were available to them, all of those different things. And it wasn't until people felt like the technology of that they had far exceeded their their own standard of living, that there were large changes in society. It actually led to, you know, a couple of different major economic transitions within the, the 20th century. But ultimately, you've seen major shifts in society because of those technology surges. And the question is, is this one of those major technology surges? Is this just a new technology like, you know, TV to internet where or, uh, you know, telephone and TV to internet where mm -hmm. now it's just a lot more media channels and it's created a lot more value and that sort of thing. Or is it moving from the country into the city where there needs to be, you know, some guardrails and guidelines put around technologies like AI, ML, and automation, just because if we don't, potentially we could end up with a workforce that, or a society where, you know, we don't have enough people or jobs to go around for the people who who need them potentially, you know? Right, right. 
Yeah, I guess I guess that is that is the the ten thousand dollar question. Yeah, how how big of a shift is this? He he has this whole thing around basically automation of self driving trucks, right? And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden now all these people their livelihoods were sort of dependent upon driving these trucks, you know, hundreds and thousands of miles. And all of a sudden that's going to be gone. And in some ways, you know, I can see the point of it that we're ta- we're talking about physical world changes. You know, the the change from phone and television to the internet was just a largely digital transformation yeah. that was really only stayed in uh, the world of uh, essentially zeros and ones. But now like this technology is reaching out and actually moving things and doing things that a potentially a human could have done in the past. So it feels like it's a little bit more of a monumental shift. Yeah. And we're the early days too. I mean, like 20 years ago, Amazon was a bookstore and now it's bigger than Walmart. You know? right. <laughs> 20 years ago, Walmart was the was the bad guy. And now people are like, well, maybe I'll just drive to Walmart so I don't have to give my money to Amazon. I've heard people say that. I know. Sure. Well, how things change, you know, whenever you're the monopoly, you're, 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 you're the bad guy. Never yeah, forget. I think that's the really interesting thing is that we do have this, this potential natural monopoly in, in technology at some point where you've got four or five different brands at the top. They are the ones that have the infrastructure and the platforms. And, you know, it's, it's interesting as a marketer and as somebody who's a technologist and, a, and somebody who is an entrepreneur who is building on top of a lot of these platforms, I feel like hopefully they continue to be seen as forces of good in our economy so that people can continue to create value for from them versus being seen as a, a negative force in that needs to be reined in or you know done away with. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's uh, change gears a little bit. Maybe talk about some uh, other things that you're doing. I guess I guess outside of of AI and and uh, machine learning. Are there any sort of like books that you're reading right now, or any sort of hobbies, other things that you do? Well, we do a lot of cooking, so. Yeah. You know, if you if you ever see my uh, Instagram page, you'll see uh, a lot of breads, you know, noodle dishes, we'll make meats, all sorts of different things. But ever since the pandemic started, that was kind of our our hobby. And it's just something that we like to do quite a bit. We read somewhat. I read a lot of business books. They're very consumable because everybody wants to write a book. And so they're all given different takes on very similar topics. But I think I think some of the timeless ones really enjoy Good to Great by Jim Collins. Um, sure. Really been a big fan of just the strengths mentality throughout my professional career. How Brands Grow is a very amazing book by Byron Sharp. It really talks a lot about the importance of uh, brand in marketing. And it talks about how brand metrics like awareness, consideration, preference, how those actually do impact sales and how brands should be thinking about them in uh, as a part of their marketing mix. Reading from other parts of of the world, we've been uh, trying to just do our part and and learn as much as we can in in today's society. So a good book is So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijoma Oluo. And, uh, you know, if you want to talk about race with friends or family in a way that's respectful or doesn't end in shouting matches over dinner tables these days. It's just, I don't know. It's a good book and something that we found to be very helpful. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. When it comes to cooking, you know, my wife and I it just started this. It probably was around the pandemic time. It's just ordering from one of this one of these companies that brings you the food, and then you have to cook it. So we oh, sure. have think, think called HelloFresh. I mean, the food tastes great. Actually, I'm 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 really really happy with the quality of it. But a lot of it is just the time together, right? And you know, we have totally. two, young, two young kids and it's, we're always running around trying to feed them and everything like that. But, you know, at least two nights a week, we have a meal that we make together for 45 minutes and we have a lot of fun with it. So that's awesome. I mean, it, it's a really, really fun sort of uh, way to relax, I think, with your significant others. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think they're of different camps, right? There's the, <laughs> it's kind of like, do you shop at stores or are you a Stitch Fix person, right? The HelloFresh deal is great because if you're, wanting to cook, but you're not 100% sure you don't have your 50 classic recipe standbys or your pantry full of things that, you know, of your staples, then then they're just going to bring you all of the things that you need. You've got your instructions, you've got your fresh ingredients, and you can do that, you know, no shopping needed. I, I no. like that too. It's a, it's a good concept. For sure. Well, you know, we're going to wind down here in the next a couple of minutes, but one of the things I like to do is ask people, you know, as you think about back on your career, because you've been doing a lot of a lot of different stuff here, Josh, you know, are there any any sort of advice that you would give people maybe that are getting started, specifically some classes that they might take or meetup groups or anything? I mean, how have you seen success that you could maybe pass on to people just getting started? 
I think people overestimate how long it takes to learn something. Mm -hmm. And so they're always looking for the one class or they're always looking for the one conference or the one person that they have to meet. I think the two or three most helpful things that you can do are just, number one, trying to find some good high level education on whatever topic that you're looking into. So for example, with AI, just simple things like learn with Google's AI. They've got some great kind of basic videos and, and education topics that tell you the basic principles. And then there are also really good full-on courses like Coursera's course by Andrew Ng. He's you know the founder of Coursera and was Google Brain's lead at one point. Really famous and helpful person just teaching the subject directly for free in Coursera. So it's not that the education isn't out there. It's just a matter of people, I guess, being intimidated by where to start and how long it's actually going to take to get there. So I think, you know, finding simple free courses like that to get started and then using some of the tools out there that are available to everybody. Google Cloud Platforms, AI tools. We use Vision ML for a lot of the Snapu project, but there's AI tables, speech to text, recommendations, natural language processing. They've got all sorts of different tools out there. And I feel like it's not as prohibitive as people might think if they've got some data and they've got a business case or or some sort of use case for for AI, a little bit of education and some, you know, rolling up your sleeves and just digging into some of the tools. That's the best way to learn, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, I'll be sure and put links to those classes that you mentioned here in our liner notes, along with the Great. books and stuff that you mentioned as well. You know, I was just thinking back to, so you want to learn about, or so, so you want to talk about Ray's. I've heard that name. There's another one out there called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson that I was just recommended. And I, I run a fair amount. I still listen to a lot of audiobooks. And that's another mm -hmm. really, really good one about race if you haven't uh, checked that one out. It's all about caste systems and how we actually are in a caste system in the United States through this. It's really interesting. I'm going to put that on my list for sure, because I think if you were to suggest to some people that we are in a caste system, I think people might think that you're being just hyperbolic or you might be overstating something. But if you do expose yourself to some of these books and other, I guess, resources that will help highlight those true parallels, it's it's not actually that surprising. Right, right. I guess when it comes to time, I mean, the, the, the audio book is probably 18 hours long to listen to some of these things. Um, and I'm probably mm -hmm. like a couple hours into it. But yeah, she's really good. It's read by the author. And I kind of came into it with some of the same feelings that, that you thought, you know, as well. It's like, well, really? But even within the first couple of chapters, she lays it out really, really well. So highly recommend it. I will drop a link to that in. What speed do you listen to your books at, Justin? Yeah, 1.5. 1.5? Yeah. I, I, then I can do 1.75 sometimes. I can't do the 2.0. That's just way too fast. No, 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 for sure. I, oh, it has to process in my brain. And like I say, I'm, I'm usually doing something while I'm listening to it, right? So I have to keep my feet running and moving <laughs> most of the time. And by the way, I'm also listening to this book as well. So yeah, I, I kind of start to miss things, I think, if I'm listening at two. For sure. I think when you read audiobooks, you, you could say that you read the book about 80%, right? Something like that. So, yeah. 80% of five books. That's four books. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I for, for me, it's also the material, just to kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent. Like, there's another uh, audiobook that I'm listening to right now that I'm, you know, I'm probably about 75% of the way done. It's called A Thousand Brains. And really, really fascinating book. I forget the name of the author, but it's the guy who founded Palm. Basically, it's very much about neural networks. And it's a, basically about how chemistry happens in your brain to essentially kind of do these predictions that everyone thinks about, you know, the classical deep learning neural net. He has a lot of data to show that's actually, he's spot on. It's actually spot on what's, what's happening, what's going on in your brain. And as you're reaching out to pick something up, for example, there's a lot of predictions that are going on with regards to, am I there yet? Is my hand there yet? Okay, I've touched it, you know? And there's a lot of reinforcement learning that's going on. But to get back to what I was saying is, it's a deep subject, right? And I find myself as I'm listening to it, it's like, gosh, it would be so much, I, I, I'd absorb it a lot more if I was actually reading a book and like taking notes. There's something about coming in through your mind and then having have you regurgitate it through writing. And I would definitely pick it up a lot more. So some certain books that are more storytelling, I feel like I actually pick up a lot better than ones that are like hardcore, deep science stuff that I really want to, you know, absorb and, and then have to regurgitate a lot. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some truth to that for sure. That's for me. So yeah, how do people reach out and connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. You can always find me at branddata.com or snappoo.com. You can see me on Twitter at JL Broughton or 
uh, drop me an email. I think our email's available on our website. So Perfect. Yeah, that's a good way too. Sounds good, Josh. Was there any other thing you wanted to mention, I guess, on the way out before we, we close this out? I think the only thing I want to say is thanks so much for having me on the podcast. It's been a real treat. Awesome. Well, great, Josh. I appreciate your time and we look forward to keeping in touch with you as you continue on your career and keep trying new things out, new technologies. Thanks so much. Take care. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.